All right, and we're recording. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Keough. I'm a librarian here at the Los Gatos Library. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight uh, for this program titled Growing Sweet Potatoes. Uh, we are so lucky to have some, some real experts here with us from the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County. Um, so very excited for tonight. Uh, I wanna thank the Friends of the Los Gatos Library. They support all of our programs. Um, you can make a donation at their website, which is friendsoflglibrary.org. Um, their bookstore is also open, so you can you can shop at their bookstore Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays from one to five. I'm really excited to be open there. And if you've heard, uh, the library itself uh, is open for the first floor. We have browsing available. Um, you can come grab your holds, come say hi to the librarians, and get a general taste of the library as it used to be. So we're very excited to be there um, seven days a week, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So come on down, get some books, say hi. Um, if you don't have a library card yet, we're happy to get that set up. We can do that from home also. So uh, you can call us or chat us Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and we can help you out. I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Karen Schaefer. Uh, Karen's been a Santa Clara County Master Gardener since 2003, um, but has been growing vegetables her whole life. So we're very lucky to have her expertise on this topic tonight. Um, we also have Master Gardener Luis Christie here to help moderate the chat. Um, so feel free to type questions into the chat. We'll have some breaks and chances to ask questions throughout, but definitely feel free to use that chat. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, glad to see a lot of you here to talk about this. This is a lot of fun to grow your own sweet potatoes. So uh, yes, uh, put your questions in the chat. Hopefully we'll be answering most of them during the course of the, the presentation. So just in case you're not from Santa Clara County, let me briefly say where we are. We're in the Northern half of, of California at the Southern tip of San Francisco Bay and just a bit inland from the Pacific Ocean. So we have warm, dry summers and cool, but not very cold winters. The reason I want to mention this is that the advice I'll be giving is geared towards residents of Santa Clara County. So some of it may not be quite right for you if you're not from this, such as planting times, climate conditions, your soil. Uh, your local master gardener or extension program should be able to give you advice on those subjects that would be more applicable to where you live. So uh, there are master gardener programs and extension programs all over the US and Canada. And uh, Louise, could you put a link in the chat for finding your local master gardener program? Uh, so all that said, most of the information that we'll be talking about tonight is applicable in general for growing sweet potatoes. Okay, sweet potatoes. The botanical name is Ipomea batata. You can see the potato batata part of that. And Ipomea, uh, it's, so it's not related to regular potatoes at all. So regular potatoes are related to tomatoes and uh, peppers and eggplants. That's the Solanaceae family. Karen? Yes. Uh, you're not screen sharing if you wanted to start doing that. I really, yeah, I thought we were screen sharing this whole time when we were getting ready. We, we were, and then it, it went to, I, had, I thought you had, okay, there you go. Great. Huh. Funny. Okay. <laughs> so there we are. Ipomea batata, Solanaceae family. It is related to morning glory, surprisingly. Uh, they are originally from Central and South America and from warm, humid regions. And this is going to be important later on as we discuss how to grow them. Now you know that they come in many different colors, they, many different skin colors, white, yellow, orange, purple, both the exterior and the interior. And sometimes the interior may not be what you're expecting from the exterior color. So as eaters of sweet potatoes, you probably know that when you cook them, some of them are moister, some of them are drier. So it's important to figure out which kind that you like best. I mean, that seems 
obvious, but sometimes you may you may buy a variety because it sounds good and then you realize you don't actually like it and you've now grown a whole bunch of them. So make sure you grow the ones that you actually like. Sweet potatoes versus yams. Okay, so this is a question that people always have about, uh, about this. And the problem is that uh, in general usage in the US, those terms get used interchangeably. Sweet potato is considered to be the more accurate term, but some varieties are still frequently marketed as jams. Um, jewel yam is just a really common term. I've seen jewel sweet potato, but sometimes it'll be marked in grocery stores as jewel yam. And you can see from these uh, from these cans that they mark them both sweet potatoes and yams on there. In the Bruce's, it says yams in big letters and then it says cut sweet potatoes and the Princella reverses it, has sweet potatoes large and then says cut yams. And so what happened is in the 1930s, uh, researchers from Louisiana State University came up with the idea of using yams to market the local sweet potatoes that they started growing there, which were sweeter and softer and moister than the firmer, drier, white flushed varieties. And okay. And um, True yams, on the other hand, look like this. So people distinguish between sweet potatoes and true yams. True yams are something that's native to Africa and Asia. It's also called cinnamon vine and Chinese yams. They are very large roots. They're very dry and starchy. Um, these roots here are three to four feet long. Notice there's somebody's leg there and somebody's foot. That's how big these things are. They are strictly tropical to actually produce uh, usable roots like this. <clears throat> and the reason that the term yam has been in use is that enslaved people from Africa, when they were brought to the South, started calling the sweet potatoes that were being grown there, nyami, which is the word for these yams in Senegalese, because it reminded them of the true yams. And so eventually that term got shortened to yam. So it's actually kind of ironic that, that the sweet potatoes they were calling yams were more similar to the true yam. And now the 1930s people started using the word yam to describe the moister, bright orange kind of sweet potato. Anyhow, so that's, that's what's going on with those two terms. You, the upshot is that it is clearest to call what we grow sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes are beautiful vines that produce these large clusters of storage roots. And, and they are roots, not tubers. You sometimes hear those used interchangeably. And if you're a botanist, you probably don't really care which is which, but these are roots. These are, are actually storage roots. Uh, they are a warm season crop that produces best from 85 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And you might be thinking, we get that hot occasionally, right? We get that hot occasionally, but not all of the time. Our average summer temperatures tend to be lower than that. We get into the 80s, you know, a fair amount of the summer, but we're always cooling down at night. And we don't often go over 90 or 95 very much of the time. So what this means is that sweet potatoes will tend to grow more slowly here than they do in say Georgia or you know, the warmer, warmer regions and especially more humid regions. So the way that you grow sweet potatoes is from something called slips. They're not grown from seeds and you grow these slips. You can buy slips but unfortunately, uh, it's difficult to find uh, people, find growers that will sell slips to California. 
The reason is that there are agricultural restrictions, important restrictions to keep diseases and pests out of California. So you, um, it might be difficult to find any place that will actually sell them. If you do buy slips, know that they may look almost dead when they arrive because they'll have taken these kind of tender shoots like this and wrapped them up and sent them through the mail for several days. They will, they will amazingly revive. They will plump up and revive and start growing uh, once once they, they've had a chance. So if you do order them and, and you get them, don't worry about that. Uh, and you can, you can keep them in containers or, or pot them up into pots when they arrive um, if you don't have time or if it isn't warm enough to plant it out yet. And we'll talk about all of that later. So it is, however, very easy to grow your own slips. So we're going to talk about that quite a bit here. Okay. So to grow your own, you can buy sweet potatoes from the market and you can, or if you have your own sweet potatoes from previous years, then you can grow them from, from those. Organic potatoes are less likely to have been treated with any anti-sprouting sprays, which you know they do to keep them from sprouting in storage when they want to sell them. Uh, small to medium sized ones are fine. They don't need to be huge, but they do need to be healthy and undamaged. You don't want to be knowingly introducing any disease into your garden. A single sweet potato will produce a lot of slips, but it's safest to start a few because they don't always sprout. Even sometimes I've talked to uh, fellow master gardeners who have used their own sweet potatoes and they say sometimes even their own sweet potatoes don't sprout for them. It's kind of hard to know why. All right, so the time to start them is February and March. And so you still do have time to start them. It can take up to 12 weeks. That's okay because you're not going to want to plant them out until it's quite warm. So what sweet potatoes need to sprout is warmth and moisture. A friend of mine who lives in Hilo, Hawaii says that her sweet potatoes will sprout just sitting on her counter and then she plants them outside. But we don't have that kind of warmth and humidity in our houses here, especially not with weather like, like we've just been having. So we will need to provide it. So there's two basic ways of, uh, of growing uh, sh these slips. I will describe the soil method first and then secondly, the water method. So the soil method you fill a, a container, a shallow container uh, that has drainage holes. So if you're reusing, like this is a, um, a takeout tray that I used here and I punched some holes in the bottom of it. So it has to have drainage. You fill it with potting soil. Some people say to use sand. I've even seen sawdust suggested. I have potting soil. It's, it's just the easiest thing I find. Uh, and then you nestle your sweet potato in. So it's about halfway into the soil and you'll place it in a, in some sort of a waterproof tray. You have to have drainage, but then you have to have somewhere for that water to drain. I like to cover it for, to enclose, uh, enclose it to keep the humidity in. This helps a lot. It's really, it's a high, it's highly recommended. It can be something simple. I simply put it, um, put this one in a, in a plastic bag. That's fine. If you're using something like uh, rotisserie chicken containers, those can be great repurposed for this. It's a nice shallow container and it comes with its own dome. So that's great. And then you'll want to keep it warm. So that can be a little tricky to figure out how to keep it warm. I have a plant heating mat. So you can see the plant heating mat here and here's another picture of it. 
So these are sold specifically for keeping seedlings warm. They're great for germinating other warm season vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, melons. It's really amazing how fast the seeds will germinate when they have a, a chance to, to get warm like that. Uh, do not use personal heating pads. They're not waterproof. They typically cannot be run for long periods of time. A plant heat mat, you can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, okay? Uh, if you don't want to invest in, in one of these, which is, you know, that's fine. If that's, this is the only thing you'd be using it for, you can try to find a warm place in your house. Some things might be on top of a refrigerator, if a radiator. You can use greenhouses or, or cold frames or hotbeds outside. Um, just be careful if it's, you don't want it to get too cold at night. We'll talk about that in a little while. And what, however you do it, uh, if you have it on heat, you do need to check it regularly to make sure that it's not drying out and keep that soil moist. And sprouts will appear in about two to four weeks. Some varieties will sprout faster than others. I started these on February 8th. So I actually started this one on February 8th. And then a week later, started these three. And I saw the first sprouts on March 1st. So about two weeks, except that the first one I started three weeks in, still hadn't put anything out. <laughs> so, and here we are. Um, this picture is just five days later on March 6th. Look how much those slips have grown. Once they get started, they're really fast. All right, the water method. So many of you might have done this as a science experiment, as kids, somebody showed you how to do this. And you, you stick toothpicks in the center of a sweet potato and suspend it in a jar of water. So it's, it's uh, the, the bottom of it is covered. You can do a whole potato like this. Some people like to cut them in half and use both halves like that. Uh, some people feel that that one end of the sweet potato is more likely to sprout than the other. And if you're not sure which end that is, then doing the half and half method is kind of nice. Let's you, uh, uh, let's you, let's you try both sides and whichever one works better. But really they, they, they will sprout anywhere. Um, they, they have many eyes on the, the sweet potato all over where it's going to sprout. So when, when you do this as a kid, you might have just let it grow. You get these beautiful vines growing out of the top of the sweet potato and they, they just go all over the counter. And it's, it's a lot of fun to see. Uh, you do, they do need to stay warm. So your kitchen counter, if you have a place to keep it a little bit warmer, that can help. But you don't want to put it in direct sun. And you should ideally change the water every week to uh, reduce any problem with bacterial growth in the water. So doing the, the uh, water method is a lot of fun. You can see the roots developing, but it takes longer to develop the slits, possibly because they're typically not being kept as warm as they are if you do the uh, the soil method and you have it on a, on a, a plant mat. So once the sprouts have gotten to be six inches long or more, you can remove them from the mother potato. So you can pull or twist the sprouts off or if you want to be absolutely sure of not transferring any disease, you can snip off the slip about an inch away from the potato then you can take those slips. So a slip 
I mean, really, this is like propagating a, a lot of uh, house plants where you can just take a cutting and you put it in water and it will root. So you're doing the same thing here. So the slips can be rooted in another glass of water. You can stick them in there and, and watch to see the roots developing. You can also put them straight into pots with potting soil. Again, it helps to if you can keep them warm, they'll, they'll be healthier, they'll develop more roots faster. You can even plant your slips straight into the garden, but only if the soil is warm enough. And again, we'll talk about that more in a little while. Uh, the roots are going to form along the leaf nodes, the place where there had where leaves had joined onto the stem. So you need to make sure that at least a couple of the nodes are in the water or in the uh, potting soil. You can let your slips keep growing along with the mother potato and they will send roots down into the soil and you can pull up a bundle of roots that way as well. You're going to be planting your slips 12 to 18 inches apart, so you may not need very many slips, just <laughs> so you know. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share here and I'm going to rearrange things slightly, get my keyboard out of danger's way, and I'm going to show you some of these in person. All right, and so we'll stop the share, tip this down. I'm doing it on a desktop computer, so I can't move it as much as people with laptop computers can. So here we have, okay, let me just get this going. Okay, so here we have the sweet potatoes that I've been growing and you can see the slips are even longer now. And let me try to harvest one of these to show you. Okay. I can't really hold this up while I'm <laughs> while I'm digging around in here. But what you do is sort of twist a little and pull a little, and here we go. So you can see I've just pulled that off and it has a few roots here down at the bottom. This would be, would develop more roots. So if I'm going to stick this into water, I would just nip that off and you can develop more roots there and more roots there. So depending on how deep my jar of water is, I don't have a very deep jar, but if I wanted to have to develop more roots, I'd put it in a deeper jar. Now, as I said, if you want to be very careful about not transferring any disease into your garden, you could snip this off like about so, about an inch in. And there's still plenty of nodes to develop roots here. So that isn't a problem, okay? So in fact, you can not do that whole business about uh, trying, to, trying to pull it off and simply go in there and snip one. So let's snip this one off. What have I got here? I got a couple of them. That's all right, there's so many here. I am not going to grow all of these slips by any means. So you can just snip it off and that's an even easier way to harvest it. Now, the vast majority of these are from those two purple potatoes that you saw. This one here, let's see, let's show this, there we go. This one is the first one that I planted and it is just starting to send up a shoot here. Very, very reluctant. I don't know why. The other orange one on the other side, that one's sending up some nice shoots, still not as vigorously as the purple ones in the center there. Uh, last night, it got very cold and I grow my 
uh, plants in an unheated sunroom. So I've got the heat mats there. I have fluorescent lights above them and, and fluorescent lights do give off a little bit of, of warmth. I was concerned and so I actually changed the timer and left the lights on all night so that they would give a little extra warmth. And mostly you can see that these are fine, but I don't know if you can see here, I'll just pick off this leaf. This little leaf was apparently sticking out beyond the, the protective edge. And that is actually frost damage on that leaf. It got down to probably 45 degrees in the sunroom and that was a little too much for it. So warm plants, they don't, they don't like getting cold. Now let me show you these. So this one, you can just see that little white spot there. That is actually a root starting to form. So it takes them a little while. That's why you have to start it a ways ahead of time, but they are getting going. And as I said, I personally prefer starting it straight into the, the potting soil so it can grow its roots out into there. And then when I go to transplant it, it's all ready to go there. If you're growing it just in, in water like this, you can plant it out into the garden, but a lot of people like to pot them up into, into soil. It just makes the transition a little easier for the plant uh, so that the roots don't get damaged as you're, as you're transplanting it. So I, I figure why go from, from water to potting soil when I can just go straight into potting soil. But some people like to see all the roots developing in the jar of water, so they like to do the water um, with the with the slips in the water. Okay, so a lot of choices. If you go read articles about growing sweet potato slips, everybody will have these list of things that you have to do. You have to use sand. You have to use water. You have to, you know, you have to. I've seen ones that tell you to place it at a 45 degree angle, to cover it entirely, to make sure it's half buried, exactly half. You know what, all of these work. All of these work, figure out which works for you and that's what you can do. Okay, Louise, do we have any questions about growing slips before I go on to the next We section? do, we do. Um, one good question, what time of year should we start growing slips? in February or March. Okay. So you still have time to start them now, especially if you start them on heat. Is there a way to remove sprout inhibitors from sweet potatoes? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm guessing it's something that might get absorbed, but it's possible it's a surface thing. I mean, you could try washing it off and see. Um, but I don't know for sure. So probably best to always buy organic. It's, yeah, that's, that's the general, the general uh, advice that you'll find is, is to buy organic. Okay. And we've had two people ask if you can eat the leaves. You can. I was actually going to bring that as a surprise towards the end, oh, but all right. Sorry. <laughs> um, one question, what about the light requirements for the slips? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Like well, if you if you if you have a setup uh, for growing your seedlings inside, so you've got like some uh, some fluorescent lights, you know, just a shop light doesn't need to be a fancy grow light. Um, you can use LED lights as well as as fluorescents, but LEDs aren't as warm. So I was actually counting on the warmth of the, the, the fluorescence mm. last night. Uh, so it's good to give them a lot of light. And the, the tricky thing, if you're not using lights like that, is that sunny windows, well, they don't want to be in the direct sun usually when they're growing, um, in, in uh, growing as slips. You can, it, it's, uh, you can overexpose them to sun when they're, they're in delicate like this. 
so it's hard to give them enough light if you're not growing it under some sort of grow light. I mean, that said, they are just slips. The point is simply to get something that you're going to be able to put outside. So a lot of people do simply raise them on their kitchen counters. What'll happen is if they will get leggy. So here, these leaf nodes are very close together. Uh, there, you can see. So here's a leaf node, here's a leaf node. They're very close together. So it'll be easy to put both of those under the soil and get and get good roots from it. If it's uh, if they're reaching for the light, you can end up with really long expanses between the, the leaf nodes where the roots are going to come from. So that can be a little tricky. So long answer there. Do you want to take a few more questions? We've got some. They're pretty good. OK, sure. A couple more. Um, Here's one that I think is pretty interesting. It's a lot like the way regular potatoes are grown. Can you just cut the sweet potato with the slip attached and to chunks and then plant that chunk? You can. Most people don't do it that way, uh, partly because, again, if you're trying to avoid introducing any disease into your garden, you may not want to to use a commercially grown sweet potatoes because they ha they aren't guaranteed to be disease free. Just because and they're organic doesn't mean they're disease free. Okay. And, but I have heard of people who uh, have been growing their sweet potatoes and when they harvest them, they miss a few. And lo and behold, despite all the admonitions about how it's going to be too cold for those things, they will actually come up again in the following years. So it is possible to grow it from a, from a chunk like that. A, a chit is what it's called when you're growing regular potatoes. That's but you're going to get a lot of vines coming off of just one. I mean, so that's the problem. I mean, look at how many vines are coming off of a very concentrated area on this. So if you want to make sure that you're going to get a nice big cluster of sweet potatoes, it's often better to make sure you have single plants rather than a, a cluster of, sh of shoots coming out of the one plant, one chit like that. Um, and then one more, I think, how much of an issue is the disease transfer from the slips? You've mentioned it several times. Is it a big issue? It's, you know, it's one of those laws of probability. Most of the time there won't be diseases. You'll look at your plants, they'll be, you'll be, you'll look at the sweet potato, they'll be healthy, but you don't want to accidentally introduce something. So, you know, we're not commercial growers. If we end up introducing something into our gardens, then maybe we just stop growing sweet potatoes for a while. How would we know if, what would be the signs? Oh, there's various bacterial things. Um, there's a, there's a good, uh, there's a, an, an excellent article on sweet potato diseases from Texas A&M. And maybe you could post a link to that in the chat if people want to read more about the kinds of things that can be transmitted. Um, um, so personally, I, I'd, I'd rather, I'd be, I'd play it safe and I wouldn't, I, I'd cut that inch above and things like that. A couple of real quick questions. Um, does Japanese sweet potato grow in Santa Clara County? Yes, absolutely. And do you know the botanical name of the true yam? I looked it up if you don't have it at the tip of your tongue. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's something, Discorea, and I, I don't remember. Alada, Dis Discorea Alada. Right, right. Excellent. Yeah. Supposedly, the flowers from that smell like cinnamon, and I've always kind of wanted to grow it just to see if they really did, but not for the root, <laughs> just, to, just to see those flowers. If you look at old seed catalogs, there, there's a couple of them where they were selling cinnamon vine a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so shall we go on here? 
We'll be taking more questions later on uh, at the end. So there'll be, actually there'll be two more times to ask questions. So let's just keep going here. So I'll start my screen share again. Uh, all right, are we screen sharing? Yes, you are. Okay, good. So preparing the soil. All right, so as you might imagine, these are big roots and they want to have room to expand. So you need to really loosen your soil at least a foot down to let those roots enlarge. <clears throat> and our clay soil here in Santa Clara County is excellent in so many ways. It is full of nutrients. It holds water well, which is great because, you know, we don't get rain in the summer. Hang on, but hang on one second, Karen. I think you're sharing um, your notes as well as the That's slide. weird. That's weird. Okay. You know, that happened once before and I clicked the PowerPoint share and yet the screen okay. share happened. There you go, looks great. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, preparing soil. Um, so mix in some organic uh, matter like compost with the clay soil to make a, a beautiful nice clay loam. So it'll be excellent for growing these and for growing any other vegetables, really. Okay. You will also want to add some sort of slow release fertilizer. Note that compost is great for improving the soil, but it adds relatively little nitrogen. Uh, so you, you'll probably want to add some sort of fertilizer, uh, but specifically a nitrogen fertilizer. So when you look at a night when a when you look at a fertilizer package, it will say um, it'll have the NPK numbers, which stands for nitrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and it'll give up these percentages of what's in there. So our clay soil tends to have plenty of phosphorus and potassium. And all you really need to add usually is some nitrogen. And you want to be careful not to add an excess of nitrogen. More is not better. So uh, it will encourage leafy growth at the expense of roots and roots is what this is all about. So follow the directions of how much to apply. And if you are a fan of alfalfa pellets, which many of us are, you can buy alfalfa pellets from a feed store in those big bags, but those aren't going to come with directions. So if you do buy ones that have no additives, no molasses and definitely no salt in them. And you'll want to use about a pound of of alfalfa pellets for one to two square foot of, of your garden bed. And a pound of alfalfa pellets is about one quart. So this is one of those uh, takeaway containers or you could use like a one quart yogurt container that will give you about the right amount to use for one to two square feet, square yards in your, in your uh, garden bed. And again, don't add too much. More is not better. Growing in containers, you can absolutely grow sweet potatoes in containers. Um, they're very beautiful, but they need to be large containers, at least four cubic feet for a single slip. So think about that, four cubic feet, that would be, you know, like uh, an 18, 18 by 18 by 18 inch container. Remember how big those roots are? They need room in the container to enlarge. So if you have a bigger container, I know somebody who grows them in, a, in a, like a three foot by a three foot, um, three foot by three foot by, by two foot deep. So like a, a big 
it's almost like a raised bed box. And, uh, and she can grow three, maybe four slips in that. Uh, if you grow three slips in that size of a, of a box, that would be giving um, six cubic feet per slip. So that's good. If they're too crowded, you will just make small skinny roots. They won't be able to develop and that's kind of not the point. So fill your container with potting soil. Most potting soil these days has fertilizer already added. So you shouldn't need to add more. You can reuse old potting soil by mixing it with two parts old soil with a one part fresh soil. So two thirds, one third. And you can add a little fertilizer as needed. The discarded potting soil can be used as a, as a soil amendment in the garden or as a mulch. And as I say, they are very beautiful ornamental plants. In fact, there is a lot of ornamental varieties um, that are grown as container plants because they spill over the edge and they're quite, quite beautiful. Those, um, those ornamental ones are true sweet potatoes also, but they have been bred for their ornamental qualities and so they are not going to make the nice big roots. The roots that they do make might be bitter. They haven't been selected for their eating qualities. So uh, grow your regular sweet potatoes as ornamentals and you get the best of both worlds. So planting your slips. As I have said several times, these are a warm weather crop. They want regularly warm days. They want that soil temperature to be above 55 degrees. So this soil temperature is only at 40 degrees. It's got 15 degrees to go. If <clears throat> the roots will rot and the foliage will wither, if the air, um, the roots will rot if the soil is too cold, the foliage will die if the air temperature is too cold. Remember, we have those cold nights. So, <clears throat> so don't push it. You're not gonna be doing yourself or the plants any favor. So what this means for us is pretty much you're going to be planting in May or June, depending on where you live. Um, raised beds and containers will warm up more quickly. And you have microclimates in your yard as well. A sunny location next to a wall or a fence or a patio might warm up faster. Um, and remember too, again, this may be obvious, but weather varies from year to year. Sometimes we have really warm springs. We've sometimes had really cold Mays um, into June even. So luckily your slips will be fine growing in their pots until you're ready to plant. So just wait until the conditions are right. You will be rewarded by much healthier plants by doing that. <clears throat> Then you want to plant your slips 12 to 18 inches apart. So you can see it won't take very many slips to fill up a bed that way. And it definitely won't take very many to fill up a container. When you get ready to plant, be sure that the rooted slips are thoroughly watered. So the, that you know, make sure that these pots are thoroughly watered and make sure that the soil whether it's in a garden bed or whether it's in a container, make sure that that soil is also moist. It's very hard to re-wet soil, especially container soil that can just shed water. So be sure it's wet, it's moistened before you plant them. And then keep them well watered. So initially, of course, the roots are just going to be three to four inches deep. So you want to keep it watered right there. But as the plant grows, you'll need to get that water going a good six inches down. How do you know? You can use a, a moisture probe. You can simply dig with a shovel or a trowel to see how moist it's getting. Obviously you wanna stay a little away from the plant so you don't damage any roots that are developing. But you actually get in there and check. There is no a single answer for how much water it needs. It needs enough water to wet it sufficiently where the water needs to go, okay? 
I know people always want to know how many, how long should I water it? How often should I water it? You have to actually check the soil to see whether it needs the water. You don't want to drown your plants. They can get too much water and you don't want them to dry out. So actually get in there, stick your hand in there and see what it feels like. Is it moist? Is it dry? Water it. Okay. And then finally, you can put down a layer of mulch on top of the soil. So a mulch is a layer of, of some material that we put on the soil surface, which helps retain moisture. It will suppress weeds and it will protect the soil. So possible mulches uh, for a, a vegetable garden would be straw, compost, dried leaves or dried grass clippings. Not too many of the dry grass clippings, they can kind of mat up and get, you know, you need to mix them with something else. Use potting soil, black plastic even. Black plastic can be useful in cases like this where you want uh, to warm up the soil. So it's, it's not a bad choice, it's not organic. The other ones will decompose and feed the soil, but there's still some advantages to that. So sweet potatoes are vines. They can take up quite a bit of room. Now you can let them spill over the bed, a side of the bed or the container. They can run onto a patio or a sidewalk, things like that. The vines don't need to be sitting on the garden soil itself as long as the plant itself is rooted. In fact, the vines will have a tendency to root all along the stem. It's that same thing, it's those leaf nodes. Wherever there's a leaf node, it can send out more roots. And you don't want it to do that because when it sends out more roots, it'll be focusing on growing too many roots and not making enough of those big storage roots. So uh, the only place you want the root formation is where you made the original planting. So having your vines on top of mulch will also discourage the, the vine rooting. Uh, if, you, if you don't have it on a mulch, then the general suggestion is that you go in and lift up the vine every now and then every, like every couple of weeks to keep anything, any roots from developing from being able to take, take hold. There are um, bush non-vining uh, varieties available. Again, you're not going to be able to tell if you're using a supermarket uh, sweet potato, whether that is most of them are vining, but uh, you can look around for that. You can try growing them up trellises. I've heard of people growing, uh, doing that successfully. And by the way, look at the little flower peeking out here. So you can see the resemblance to morning glories. Some varieties seem to flower more readily than others. So it's kind of fun when you get one of those. And yes, the leaves and the young shoots are edible, um, very productive spinach substitute in the summer. I know people who grow them primarily as, as their warm weather spinach substitute. All right, I'm going to push through to harvesting and then take questions at the end if that's okay. Louise, are we okay for? Um... Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. So when to harvest? Uh, most varieties take 90 to 150 days from planting to harvest, which is three to five months, okay? But our weather is not consistently warm. Um, we have those cool nights. So it's really best to figure on it taking the full five months. So that means planting in May or June and harvesting in October or November. And much of the root enlargement seems to happen in that final month. So it's really worth it to wait as long as you possibly can. But you want to do it before the soil cools down below 55 degrees. Um, that happens slowly for us. We tend to have warm falls, so you're, you're probably going to be fine. But you do need to watch out for frost because if it gets frosted, then the vines may die back. So if you see the vines dying back, that is a definite clue that it is time to harvest those sweet potatoes. So here's a beautiful cluster of freshly dug sweet potatoes. What you want to do is 
If you can, stop watering for two weeks beforehand. What that will do is it will let the soil get drier so they won't be as, as heavily caked with, with um, you know, the, our sticky, muddy clay soil. Um, these probably were ha had the water cut off because they're, they're just lightly covered with soil. Choose a dry day to harvest. And if possible, harvest the roots in the morning. And I will tell you why those two in just a minute. So you'll want to cut off and remove the vines before digging. You can see here where they've been cut off. So these vines are obviously quite green and lush still. You need to get them out of there so you can see what you're doing. We find spading forks work really well for, um, for digging. But if you don't have a spading fork, then fine, use a shovel. What you do want to do is take care not to bruise or cut the roots when you're digging them. So you'll want to start digging two or three feet away. So towards the edge of the bed and, and work your way in. These roots really spread out quite a bit in the soil. I mean, we see them da going down like this, but they're also going outward quite a bit. <clears throat> And then, so handle them uh, very gently to, to pre prevent any scuffing or bruising. They are, um, they're actually very delicate at this point. So don't wash them, even though they're dirty. So that's why if you can stop the watering, then they won't be as dirty and, and that will help because you can't wash them. You can remove the dirt after curing and we'll talk about curing on the next slide. Okay. So after digging them, you'll let them dry for two to three hours. So that's why it's useful if you can start in the morning on a dry day when it's not expected to be raining and you can let them sit out and dry off some out in the sun. It helps them firm up, um, helps the skin firm up a little bit here. And you'll trim off and discard any of the uh, any of these fibrous roots, any of these little skinny ropey ones, those are not actually going to be um, useful sweet potatoes like that. But you can see there's several very nice sweet potatoes in this cluster. So these are the ideal conditions, but do whatever you have to do. If we're getting early rains, if the weather's turning cold, if you've got frost, get out there and harvest them rather than waiting because you don't want the cold weather to entirely ruin the roots. Curing. So curing is a process that um, improves the flavor because sweet potatoes are starchy and when they are cured, the starches will turn to sugars. So a freshly dug sweet potato may not be as tasty as you expect it to be. It kind of depends. I've had ones that were okay, but a lot of them can be just, they're just, they're not what you, they're not the sweet potatoes that you love. And most importantly, curing increases storage life. It toughens up this skin outside. And you see here these, um, these sort of um, brown tan bits. Those are places where these roots had been uh, scuffed a bit and, and the skin had been damaged and the curing process will help those heal over so that they'll last longer in storage. So how do you cure them? You need to store it someplace warm, so 80 to 90 degrees, humid, so 85% humidity, um, which most of us don't have, but have um, ways to measure humidity, but just somewhere where you've got some moisture in it. And you need to store them like that for 10 to 14 days. So possible ways to do this, you can use paper bags with a moist paper towel tucked inside. It's not very exact for that humidity, but the point is simply to have some humidity in there. So you'd seal the top of the bag and place it in a warm place. Um, maybe your attic is warm, maybe you have a greenhouse that you could put it in or, or a mini greenhouse. Uh, maybe your bathroom is warm and you could keep it in your bathroom if your spouse wouldn't mind. Uh, 
you can if you're using a greenhouse or something like that some people say they put buckets or trays of water inside to keep the uh, increase the humidity so you have to be a little creative at that point we are cooling down i've used my attic but honestly it's not always that warm that time of year but here's the thing purdue university gives us this little blessing in the absence of better facilities, they can be cured at a lower temperature for two to three weeks. So, so do what you can. It is really worth doing. And if you want to do a little experiment, you can keep a couple of them out and a couple of them that, that, you, that you do the curing with, and you can see. And what you'll find is those uncured ones will indeed wither rather quickly. Then you want to store them somewhere cool, but not cold. If they are below 50 degrees, they are very susceptible to rot like this. Keeping it at 55 to 60 degrees, they store beautifully. Again, can be tricky. Find the place in your house that works for this. If it's better to err on the side of too warm than too cold. So finally, your timeline summary, start your slips in February, March, root, uh, pot them up in March and April, and in May or June, you'll be transplanting. In October, November, you harvest and cure. So there we go. Let us take any questions. I will stop sharing again. Oh, I was just going to suggest maybe you could put that schedule up again. That was pretty nice. Ah, OK, sure because we had some questions related to that okay. the timing. Wow. You know what? I just saw what happens. That is so weird. Ah, okay. I know what happened with the, oh, go back. There we are. There we go. Okay, yes. So uh, let's see, we do have a few questions. Um, can you reiterate, where do you keep the slips between when you plant them and then in the pots and then until May? I keep mine under my grow lights because Indoors. I have a grow light set up that I'm using for that. But you want to keep them, you need to keep them warm. Um, it doesn't have, it wouldn't have to be on a heat mat, but you would want to, to keep them warm. So you could keep them in the house in, in a sunny window if you needed to. Um, when they're planted outside, how much direct sun do they need? They need complete sun. These love heat, love sun. These are not, no partial shade for these. I mean, really no partial shade for any vegetable, but especially not a sun lover, a heat lover like these. For a container, I, someone asked how deep the soil needs to be. I assume that question was about a container. Right, so if you think about it, you know, those, those roots are growing, um, they, they, they will grow typically eight to 10 inches. So it really needs to be deeper than that. So I, I would say you'd want it to be at least 18 inches deep to have to give them enough room to really grow. And also have, oh. at least 18 inches wide. So imagine a square, big square round container. And that would be for one slip? One slip because one slip will grow a cluster of potatoes like that. So you get a lot out of a single slip. What is your opinion about potato grow bags that are open at the bottom? Would they be good for sweet potatoes? They would probably, they would probably work. I haven't looked into it, but uh, the, the plastic would help them stay warm, which would be a useful thing and would keep them moist. Probably it would give them enough room to grow. Again, they, they grow differently from potatoes. So um, I, I haven't looked at those grow bags enough to, to really say for sure. Give it a try and let us know. 
and, and someone else has asked, what happens if you mix regular potatoes and sweet potatoes in the growing area? You know, they really have different culture requirements. Uh, so I wouldn't try to put them right next to each other. You're harvesting your, your regular potatoes, you're going to be harvesting much sooner than you would be harvesting sweet potatoes. So they may seem similar. You also plant regular potatoes much earlier than you'd plant sweet potatoes. They're really very different. Uh, we had a couple questions related again to the eating of the leaves. If you eat the leaves, how much does that reduce the production of the potatoes, if it does? Well, obviously you wouldn't want to cut so much of the vine that, that it would be bare, but really these are prolific vines. So if you're harvesting them for, you know, once they have started growing vigorously, you will see they, they are just full. I mean, you saw how full my, my um, bag of uh, a pot of slips were. Uh, you can harvest really quite a bit of that and still still be fine. Just don't harvest, I don't know, no, you wouldn't want to harvest more than say 10% of the vine. That would be a lot of leaves still. It would still be a lot to eat. Yeah. Um, someone did ask about pests. Um, they said that their sweet potatoes were getting eaten last year. I think they meant that the actual potato itself was getting eaten. And I have also just posted um, in, the, in the chat that link from Texas A&M about diseases. Right, right. Well, it's possible, uh, certainly the usual things are, are many of our usual pests like gophers, if it's being eaten while it's in the, the ground, it might be something like gophers. Uh, there's other, other things that might be. So if it happens again, I would say, and if you're in Santa Clara County, contact our help desk and they will help you diagnose what's happening with it. If you're not in Santa Clara County, contact your local Master Gardener program and they'll give you advice for your area. What is your favorite, favorite sweet potato to grow? The white, the orange, the Japanese, or the purple? <laughs> well, again, you have to grow what, whatever you like. Um, I, I, I have to admit to a fondness for the purple ones, but really if your favorite sweet potato to eat is one of those, those delicious uh, moist orange ones, then that's the one you should grow. Uh, we're, we keep getting more questions coming in here. Um, one I think is a good one here. Would cardboard work as a mulch underneath the vines? What would you think? Uh, yeah, that, that might work. That might work. Um, trying to think if there'd be any downside to it. You know, one problem that we can have here is, uh, is we do have a lot of slugs and snails and something like cardboard can encourage them. And, and to be honest, black plastic can encourage them too. So even though slugs and snails are usually a cool weather pest for us, when you've got something that lets them stay cool underneath and, and moist underneath the soil like that, uh, they can sometimes become a bit of a problem. So that'd be my, I think my only hesitation with, with that. Also, the, also cardboard would keep the soil cool. So you'd want to, again, make sure that the soil had gotten nice and warm before you put it down. So it, it could be a little tricky. Um, we do have a question that asks, if the plant will continue to grow in the next few years, if I'm not going to harvest them now. So I think you could clarify. Right. <laughs> not, not if you're uh, not somewhere tropical, not here in Santa Clara County, they will die every fall. When you plant the slip, how much foliage do you leave above the ground? Oh, that's a good question. You can plant it all the way down. So it's, you know, this is kind of like, uh, like potatoes. You can do this with uh, not potato, tomatoes uh, too. You could plant it all the way up to just leaving the top bit of it exposed because all of those nodes that you put underground will, will root. You don't have to. You could also simply, you know, like if I have one like this 
where I have in the pot, I'm probably just going to plant it so it's it's sticking up the same way it is, the same as it is in the pot. But you can plant them deep. Let's see. How many potatoes do you get per plant on average? Do you know? You'll get typically one to two pounds of potatoes. So it, it will vary, but you know, we saw that uh, I don't think I can go back to that that quickly, um, but the you saw the one where it was that cluster and it was probably about five or so potatoes that, that developed there. You get a nice number. They look pretty productive. Mm -hmm. I think it would be good to finish up with these last questions about um, where can I buy slips if I want to? And does the Master Gardener program grow slips to sell? We do not grow slips to sell, although maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea for future years. I will talk to some people about that because it is hard to find them here. Uh, you can do a search online uh, a number of places sell them. The problem is that sometimes they will say very explicitly right there on the page that cannot be shipped to, and then they'll list all the states that they can't ship to. Others will sometimes not tell you until you've gotten to the checkout. And that's really annoying when you think you found a place that'll grow it. So it, it might be good to, rather than strictly um, doing it online, you might want uh, to call them up if they have a phone number and, and see if you get a knowledgeable person and ask if you're going to be able to order them. Well, it looks like we're out of questions. Okay. And I think, I think oh, we're... Well, if I knew, if I knew if I said that, there'd be another one. <laughs> what would you like to do? Keep going? Uh, well, theoretically, we, we finished at six, but I can take a couple more questions if that's okay with Daniel. Yeah, let's take this last. Yeah, let's take this last question here. It's like, um, is there such a thing as a soil thermometer? Absolutely. There is. Yes, there are soil thermometers. Uh, yes, so you can buy, you don't, you know, you may not want to use your kitchen thermometer out in the soil, you may want to have a dedicated one. <laughs> you can certainly use a kitchen thermometer for a soil thermometer, um, but no longer in the kitchen, right? <laughs> and then there are ones that you can buy ones that are called compost thermometers that have really long probes. Um, but you don't need a very long probe for this, it's, it's shallow where you need to measure. Okay, well, I wish everyone happy sweet potato growing. I hope you have healthy slips and, and uh, beautiful sweet potatoes this summer. Thank you so much, Karen. That was really great. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody. This is recorded and we'll start to get that uploaded to YouTube um, tomorrow for the West Coast Library. And we'll also have it uploaded at the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County's YouTube. So okay. thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Louise. It's been great. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. Good night.